Hey guys, Dr. Pelto here. Uh, I'm, we did a recent uh, webinar on Halix Luminous. Uh, many of you have liked that in the past. I'm going to include it right here, and um, you're gonna you can listen to it. Also, if you want to see the video, it'll be on my blog. I'll put a link underneath that if that's helpful. Okay. Once again, hope this is great. Okay. Bye bye. In here. So, in case anyone else uh, couldn't make it, uh, we're going to have this recorded for everyone. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone here. Uh, on the call, we have uh, myself, Don Pelto, uh, Dr. Pelto, uh, Dr. Ben Saviet. Say hi, Dr. Saviet. Hey, everybody. Uh, Dr. Sam Kellner, he's here as well. Hello. And our beloved Dr. Feldman, he is here virtual. So that's pretty amazing how we can do this uh, virtually. Uh, he had another engagement. So once again, we'd like to Thank everyone for joining. We're gonna be talking tonight about stiff big toes. The reason we used this term stiff big toes is because sometimes people don't know the technical term. Uh, one of the technical terms is called hallux limitus or hallux rigidus or arthritis. But for the most part, those that deal with this issue have a hard time or have pain when they're bending their big toe. And what we're going to talk about uh, tonight, we're going to talk about what causes it. Now, this is something that Dr. Feldman will be talking about, and he is going to go through how, you know, you, when you put on shoes and you started walking and sitting all day, it caused uh, big toe joint arthritis. And we're going to talk some about the modifications and shoes and orthotics that you can do. Dr. Kelman will talk about some of the x-rays and ultrasounds and different types of imaging. I'll do some of the non-surgical treatments. Uh, Dr. Saviet will talk about some of the the brand new treatments and some of the possibilities for the future. And then as well, some of the surgical treatments. And then some of you sent some questions over uh, before and we're gonna try to answer them. If you have any other questions, you can put them in the chat bar. Uh, so we'll get right into it, kind of what causes um, this. All right, thank you, Don. And thank you everybody for showing up. I, I wish uh, I could have been here live. I had to uh, record this in advance. Um, but as always, if there's any questions that anybody has, please feel free to ask uh, the panel at large or to reach out to me personally or any of the doctors at, um, at our office because we're, we're here to help educate, guide, and, um, and help you out the best that we can. Um, great question in terms of what causes big toe joint arthritis or really any arthritis at all. And I guess the real question is how far back in time do you want to go? Um, one of the jokes that I use a lot is from uh, the movie Airplane, um, when um, when somebody says, oh my God, what, what happened? And um, somebody comes in and says, well, first the earth cooled, then the dinosaurs came, but they got too big and fat. And, um, you know, so if you want to start back in the, in the beginning of time, you can start back in the beginning of time, um, or you can talk about um, last week or last month. Um, the point is that arthritis develops over a lifetime. When you have pain on a Tuesday, it's not because of something that happened on a Monday, unless, of course, there was a traumatic injury. But we're not talking about trauma. We're not talking about dropping um, a weight on your foot or a rock on your foot or stubbing your toe into something or an accident. What we're talking about is, is something that you moved your way into and uh, you either move properly or you don't move properly. And if you're not moving properly from a young age, then as you get older, your, your poor movement is going to lead to joints that aren't moving as they're supposed to move. And eventually those joints are going to potentially wear out. Not all of us are, are lucky enough to, to have good joints throughout life. Um, and just because we have joints that wear out doesn't even mean we're aware of them. Again, um, problems and symptoms are two different things. And arthritis is something that develops over time. At some point, we're likely to become symptomatic, um, depending on our activity level, uh, things that we might wanna do, uh, shoes that we, we end up wearing, um, it could be a variety of reasons why we get symptomatic. Um, the big thing I like to, to point out to people, though, is that chairs and shoes were never part of the, the quote unquote master plan, meaning um, for our feet to develop properly as they're supposed to be, we should never have put shoes on them because shoes are confining to toes. They weaken the muscles of the toes. They don't allow the joints, tendons, uh, and the structures to work as they were supposed to work. That doesn't mean all shoes are bad. It just means they distort or disturb normal development. 
and then we develop accordingly. Um, some people's feet genetically develop in a certain way and might be different from other people, but shoes are not necessarily going to impact us all the same. Um, my wife and daughter, for instance, have the same foot type and they were very susceptible to poor fitting footwear. Uh, whereas my son and I were a little less susceptible um, or susceptible, I should say, in different ways. Uh, my wife and daughter were susceptible to bunions. My wife had a bunion at a very young age. My daughter had me as a father, so she still has no bunion, but she's 18 and stopped listening to me about 18 years ago. So who knows what's going to happen with her. Um, but shoes can be very damaging to a foot that's developing, and we're not really going to know about it for many, many years. And, um, you know, if it's 40 or 50 years later, um, there's probably a uh, um, or there's a, a very high likelihood of having arthritis. Again, whether it's symptomatic or not, totally different story. Uh, the other piece of the equation is chairs. Sitting is bad for human beings. Movement is good. Standing is good. Walking is good. Sitting is going to tighten up the hips. It's going to weaken your core, and it's going to lead to to poor movement habits, which again, ultimately is going to lead to uh, poor mobility of the hips, knees, ankles, and feet. And um, it's one of the things that leads to arthritis, uh, not just of the hips. In fact, a lot of times too much sitting causes stiffness in the hips. So we stop using the hips and it stresses movement elsewhere, like the low back or the knees or the feet. So a lot of people that have low back pain, knee pain, ankle or foot pain, it really starts in the hips. It's from the hips. It's from poor hip mechanics. And the irony is the hips may look great because they just have never been used the way that they were supposed to be used. Not everybody, again, but but some people and, and enough people out there where it is a, it is a real problem. Um, if you wanna fix many of these issues, you gotta go way back in time. Um, so when somebody builds a time machine, then I think we can be a lot more effective in how we go about treating people because the best way to treat these things is to prevent them. Best way to prevent them, again, go back in time uh, maybe we can help our own kids out, but uh, as we develop, as we learn to walk, as we learn to move, as we learn to run, we want to do so in the right manner. So milestones are really important. If, if children, for instance, in this picture, if they skip a, a significant step like crawling, they're not going to have reciprocal movement of their arms and legs. And therefore, running like this little girl on the right-hand side of the screen does is going to be a very challenging event for this child who skipped crawling. Um, now, kids can overcome lots of things, and kids are just kids, but at 20 or 30, some people may struggle later on. And again, it, it could be anything. We're talking about big toe joints, so uh, the big toe joint obviously is, is, is also fair game along with other uh, body parts. But uh, just understand that growth and development uh, play a key role in whether joints are going to break down or not. Uh, poor hip function, sitting, uh, the screen on the left, you can see the, uh, the rotation in the arrows uh, represents sitting motion, a forward hip tilt, which tightens up the, the structures on the, on the back side of the pelvis. Um, I do have my pelvis right here. Um, and so we have the front of the knee, the front of the hips, and the back of the hips. I'll just turn it around so it matches the, uh, the picture. But hamstrings attach to the back of the pelvis. And if our hip tilts forward like this, our hamstrings are going to pull up on everything. It's going to tighten everything on the back side of our body. It's going to tighten up our ankles, make our ankles stiffer so that when our bodies move forward over our foot, our heel is going to lift up early and we're going to jam the big toe joint. If you're constantly jamming the big toe joint, you're not giving the big toe joint a chance to, to bend as it's supposed to and where it's supposed to. You combine that with a poor fitting shoe and that's the recipe for why people end up in our office or any doctor's office with painful big toe joints. Um, picture on the right, uh, we talk about poor posture versus good posture. There's uh, many different types of poor posture. Uh, there's one good type of, of good posture. And, and posture is really key because posture is our body's ability to negate the effects of gravity. Gravity is always acting on us. If we have good posture, then gravity is going to have a pretty neutral effect. As posture kind of becomes worse, gravity has a greater effect. And the impact on the feet is significant because the feet are what resists us from collapsing down. Um, a lot of people try to correct posture by throwing their shoulders back and, and tilting their hips forward, which you know, it's kind of the way we were taught as kids, and many of us were taught as kids, but it's not the right way. It really has to start in the pelvis, getting the pelvis back to a neutral position, 
having the spine moving up and the legs moving down, uh, again, neutral to gravity. Um, we all have different builds, so therefore we can all have slightly different postures, but again, what's neutral to gravity um, is unique to me, which is unique to somebody else and somebody else. And, you know, mind you, nobody's ever going to be perfect. We're all going to struggle. We all wear shoes growing up. We all sit uh, growing up. So we are all going to have different um, uh, negative impacts on our posture and on our movement. And we don't have to be perfect. We just have to be good enough to do the things that we want to do in life uh, and not hurt. And again, symptoms versus problems. Problems exist all over our body. We're only aware of that which hurts. So when something hurts, again, it's not about something that happened yesterday. It's oftentimes something that's been years in the making, and we have to address a lot of different areas um, to make something better. Um, one of the things that I really like to have people start with, especially with, with arthritis of the big toe joint, is the um, idea of proper shoe fit. Now, the best shoe that any of us have ever worn was the one we were born with. It fit perfectly. It uh, didn't negatively impact posture um, by having an elevated heel, and it was very lightweight. It weighed no more than our foot does. When you add a shoe to that, you're going to confine the toe. You're going to negatively impact posture if there's a heel, um, and it's going to add weight, which is going to add more work and effort. So our ideal um, shoe is something that interferes as little as possible with the foot you have, as well as the activities you want. So if you're 50 um, and you've always worn shoes with a bit of a heel, it's probably going to be pretty hard to go to a flat shoe. However, if you're somebody that really prefers to be barefoot or uh, loves Birkenstocks or sandals or flip-flops, you know, maybe it's just the confinement of not allowing your toes to spread uh, that you need. So going with something that's flat and without support, but something that allows your toes to spread may be the best for you. Whereas if you're somebody that likes um, likes a shoe, likes something stiffer and more, you know, quote unquote supportive, uh, then a shoe with a bit of a heel is probably going to be uh, your best bet because that's going to help you maintain your best posture that you have now. And I do like two styles of shoes. I like shoes that are soft and shoes that are, are firm. And, um, and then you choose whatever heel elevation feels most comfortable. Um, but a key to me is, is, again, matching the shape of the shoe to the shape of the foot, not the other way around. So, so uh, the, the shoe on the, in the middle, the wide toe box shoe, that's the way all children's feet look, nice and square, nice and straight. Um, whoever started making narrow-toed shoes years and years and years ago, decades, hundreds of years ago, uh, it was just really about style. Uh, and appearance. It had nothing to do about function, um, but it ends up ruining function uh, later on in life. So the younger you start with the wider toe box, the better. Um, you can get away with shoes like on the far right or the far left if your foot looks like that now. Um, so there are ways. Um, so it's not um, one size fits all. Another thing you can do is um, you can skip the first laces on the shoes. Um, so you don't have to lace it the way that you purchase the shoes. Sometimes the lace sitting on the big toe joint creates uh, um, an area of pressure and an area of pain. So sometimes just removing that pressure uh, off can be very helpful, especially if you have a big bone spur on the top of the joint. And you'll see these in x-rays later. Again, looking at the bottom of these shoes, every one of these shoes is a more sort of human foot shaped shoe. Um, the three to the left are a little bit better, but um, you know, we're all sort of uh, a little different. Some people have wide feet, some people have narrow feet, but we still want shoes that match the shape of our feet. Um, orthotics are something that we also uh, can do to help people. Um, one of the things that I try to understand with the patients that have arthritis in the big toe joint is the joint mobile, is mobility possible? Or has the arthritis advanced to the point where the joint is now very stiff and has no chance of moving? It's an important distinction to make because if the joint has mobility and it's just poor mobility, an orthotic can really help improve mobility by, by creating modifications in the orthotic to put the bone and the joint in a better, or the bones that make up the toe joint and the toe in a much better position so that you can use the range of motion you have. Whereas sometimes the arthritis is so far advanced, what we try to do is stiffen up the orthotic underneath the big toe joint so that when we're moving, we're not forcing the big toe to bend. We're, we're sort of bracing it from the outside. So we're not forcing that joint to bend and it's not gonna hurt quite as much 
um, but our orthotics for them to make a difference, for them to impact how the foot moves and functions, they do have to be firm and stiff. I prefer um, a thin polypropylene or a carbon graphite device. They hold up a long time. They conform perfectly to the foot and we're able to um, fit them into shoes. Uh, it is important to understand what type of shoe they're gonna go into because um, sometimes um, people will get orthotics and they'll come back to me and say, well, the orthotics don't fit into any of my shoes. I put the orthotic under their foot I have them stand up, look down, I ask them, do you see the orthotic at all? They say no, and I say, well, there you go. Those shoes do not fit your foot. Uh, orthotics are made to a foot. If the orthotic doesn't fit into the shoe, then the shoe that you're wearing doesn't fit your foot. It's your choice to wear whatever it is that you wanna wear. When you're looking for guidance and help though, understand if you try to put something on your foot that doesn't fit and you have pain in a joint, then you're pretty much asking for it. So while it's nice to wear dress shoes and um, and to wear something that goes with a certain outfit at a certain event, it's also nice to know what you can go back to for exercise, running, uh, working out, and maybe just day-to-day -day life uh, where dressing a certain way isn't so important. But they also do have dress shoes that are made wider and more square, and they do make dress shoe orthotics. While not as good, um, maybe better than an alternative, but it's only as good as the shoe you put it into. So the shoe really has to be the first thing um, that you're looking at. Um, and that's about it. So um, again, any questions? All right. <clears throat> uh, Don, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> that was a good one from, from Dr. Feldman here. Let me, uh, let me just re uh, get these going here for Dr. Kellner. He's gonna be, going a little bit over the, the diagnostic imaging. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Kellner. Sure. All right. um, so these are just three pictures of uh, different uh, imaging modalities you might use. Um, the left two pictures are, are from our office. The left, farthest left is the x-ray machine in our Westboro office. Middle is um, our diagnostic uh, ultrasound. And on the right is an MRI, which we do not have. Not many private offices would. <laughs> um, so just to get an overview, uh, pretty much anybody walking into a podiatry office with big toe joint pain should get x-rays. It's kind of a, it's a baseline type thing for me. Um, gives a, a lot of information. Um, that being said, it's important to treat the patient and not just the x-rays, but this does give a lot of information. So on the left-hand side, um, uh, what, what Dr. Pelto is circling is the big toe joint of, of focus. Um, it's kind of right where the uh, metatarsal meets the base of the phalanx. And you can see those two little peanut shaped bones underneath. Those are called sesamoids. Um, and those also articulate with the joint as well. So it's important to evaluate those. Um, as I tried to show progression of the, of the disease process, um, in the mild type of arthritis, we can see that there's a narrowed joint space. There's, there's less space between the bones. Um, and I also note that the, the, the head of the metatarsal is a little bit more square shaped and not as well rounded. Um, those, those are kind of early signs of, of an arthritic joint. Um, moving on to moderate, you can see that there's uh, further irregularity of, of the joint space itself. Um, there's kind of sharp edges at the at the corners of the bone. Those are called little osteophytes. Um, those are caused from from jamming. Um, and then you can see on the areas where there's a little bit of bone on bone. And then moving to the ad advanced stage, um, that that's severe arthritis. Um, certainly can try non-surgical attempts, but I'm sure if that person's symptomatic and having pain, you know that that's the type of person where where, where surgery would be the kind of one of the only options really to fix it. Uh, it's important to look at the side view too. Um, uh, at the top, we can see what's considered a, a essentially normal x-ray, especially looking at the that first um, uh, big toe joint. And then comparing that to what's called an elevatus, which is an elevated first metatarsal. Um, I guess the words didn't carry over, but see on, on the normal x-ray, there, there's two lines there and they're essentially parallel. The line that's going straight through the ankle bone, which, which is higher up there where the mouse is, is that line's bisecting the ankle bone there. And it's also bisecting the uh, first metatarsal. And those lines are essentially parallel. 
Um, when we look at the abnormal x-ray, we can see that bisection of one bone compared to the metatarsal. Um, because that's how we kind of grade or, or, or measure um, an angular deformity or the elevated metatarsal. So important to evaluate for as it comes to treatments. Uh, ultrasound is not something I routinely use for, for this, but it certainly gives a lot of information in terms of the soft tissue and what's overlying the, the joint. <clears throat> um, in this image here, this is just a kind of a basic image of, of the probe uh, scanning over the, the skin level, which is sending sound waves down and whatever's most dense uh, bounces back and shows up as a, an image. So that bone is the sharp white line that you can see that he's outlining. Um, it's important for looking at the soft tissues here, all that dark space above the bones, it would be infusion, effusion, which is inflammatory fluid. Um, and actually this is an ultrasound of gout. So that what that white arrow is pointing to is a little, um, it's called double line sign. Those are gouty deposits along the joint. So that's, that's the kind of definition you can get from this, which is important. Um, MRI, again, not something I routinely use for evaluating this. I, I certainly consider it when it comes to surgical planning. I would think if the uh, x-ray looked pretty good, but the patient was having pretty significant pain, there's concern for articular damage and cartilage damage. Um, so this MRI is kind of showing what that cartilage damage uh, might show up as, um, where there's a bright white signal uh, at the head of the metatarsal bone. Um, and kind of going into the joint, there's certain levels of cartilage damage, and that's would come to, you know, what considerations, either non-surgically or surgically. Thank you, Dr. Kellner. Um, I'm going to go over uh, some of the non-surgical treatments. So these are some of the things that you could do. Um, I, Dr. Feldman talked about a few of these, and I'm going to go into some detail. And there were some questions about these after I'm going to address so what can you do to avoid surgery? Some, some of the common things you could do an anti-inflammatory. Uh, I usually have patients try um, a two week uh, dose. You could do naproxen, which would be two a leave twice a day for a couple of weeks if, you're, if your stomach can handle it. Um, people can do ibuprofen, there's other things. The issues with anti-inflammatories, I don't like patients to be on them for a long period of time because it can cause uh, different types of stomach issues and, and really, if, you, if, you're, if you're really needing that much pain relief, there might be some other options that are better than taking a medication. So I would say try a short period if, you're, if your doctor will allow you to do that. Um, icing can be helpful. This is the, everything that we talk about, we say that icing can be helpful. It can help reduce some of the inflammation around the joint. Um, this is something called a contrast bath. And actually, uh, uh, Dr. Savvy, he's the one that kind of got us on this. You, you take five minutes in an ice bath and a five minutes in a hot bath and a five minutes in an ice bath. You go back and forth. And this, I kind of equate it to resetting the computer. So basically it shocks your body, uh, cold, hot, and cold, and it helps with the swelling. Now, both of these, the anti-inflammatories and this icing technique, I would say, let, let's say you, you, you have this... Um, toe arthritis, but it's, it's usually not a problem. But then let's say you, you're doing a lot of squatting and kneeling when you're painting and it gets really inflamed, you know, that's when you would do stuff like this. It's not something that you're going to do every single day for the rest of your life. This is a, an incident, like wearing a bad shoe, a very flexible shoe, going to an event, doing something where it gets aggravated until it calms down. So a lot of these can be done to calm things down. These are not going to take away all that arthritis that Dr. Kellner talked about. It's not gonna do that. It's just gonna help you when it gets inflamed. It's a good option for you. Um, there are some physical therapy modalities. Now, I sometimes, a great physical therapist is worth their weight in gold. And we have some great ones that we refer to, but not all physical therapists are able to resolve big toe arthritis, right? They can help a little bit with the arthritis. They can help strengthen some of the muscles around it. They can help um, your toe to purchase a little bit more by pulling it down. There's a technique where you can just almost like crack in your joint. You, you pull it out and you, and you relieve some of the tension that's in there. So it almost gives the joint a little bit more space. There's actually a surgical technique that's similar that decompresses, we call it, uh, the joint and gives it a little bit more space. Those are helpful, albeit probably temporary. And it really depends on 
the amount of, of arthritis. So as Dr. Carolyn showed, it, it may be like the mild to moderate, but you know, the, the, the severe and the one that's almost fused, not gonna work so well. So some of these can work at different phases uh, when you're dealing with your hallux limitus or your, your arthritis and your big toe joint. Cortisone, um, I use it more as a, a diagnostic and a therapeutic tool in the office. That just means it's gonna help me to diagnose. So if you do an injection to that joint that's bothering you um, and all the pain goes away, you can realistically say that that joint is the problem and if you fuse that joint, which uh, uh, Dr. Savage is going to talk about, it, and, and there's no more joint there, that's what it's going to feel like. There's not going to be any pain. I tend to use a limited number of cortisones. I know there are certain specialties, for example, maybe in the hip and the knee, they'll do it every three months. They'll do three a year, pretty much forever. Or they'll do a type of a, a synvisc, which is a, a lubricant. Um, in our in our practice, we don't use those. I, I think some people might use some something like that, a lubricant. We're not doing that. We we have some kind of regenerative, some advanced things that are we, we kind of play around with that might might or might not work. Um, but a, a limited amount of cortisone. I think I, the reason I use cortisone, for example, if someone's going to go on a hiking trip and they know that they're going to do a lot of activity and they have uh, arthritis in the big toe, I'll say, you know, why don't you come a week or so before. I'll give you the cortisone that'll last you through your hiking trip and, you, and you'll be able to feel better. Okay, that's how I use cortisone. Dr. Feldman alluded to this, this alternate lacing. I just have an example right here. Basically, you, you can put the laces here or even skip these, you skip up. And so if you have a, a bump on top, a big arthritis up there, it can be helpful for that. Here's an example of a shoe that actually has biased lacing. You can see it's not right in the center, I think this one was a gel Cayano uh, type. I know we're not supposed to talk about shoe types, but this is one that there's not many that are like this, but it's on the side and it helps the big toe to, to bend and move a little bit better. Shoes are uh, really important for this. And, and then uh, there is a possibility if you have a really inflamed joint uh, and it really hurts a lot, you can do a type of a taping technique. I don't think I've ever done something this extravagant, but I've tried different types of taping. Um, if you want to mobilize it as well, you can put some into a walking boot. These are, if it's really, really inflamed, if you really overdo it. So I might do this with a cortisone injection or with a walking boot just to calm things down until you're able to uh, do, do more definitive treatment afterwards. I just want to explain just kind of my philosophy uh, behind like orthotics. And someone also asked about this wedge that uh, Dr. Savage is going to talk a little bit about. But basically, if you have a bad joint, if you have a that really bad one or severe arthritis, you want to reduce the movement. And you can do that with like a carbon plate that goes in your shoe. Or this is a, a kind of an example of an orthotic that has this extension in the front. So both of these are used to not allow that to bend. Now, if you have a, a better joint, a good joint that has hallux limitus, or uh, we haven't talked about this, something called functional hallux limitus that I think uh, Dr. Savvy is going to talk a little bit about. And, and I'm actually going to put this on the link afterwards on our blog, I'll put his, his um, he has a couple of good blog articles on how it's limited, so I'll include that if you'd like to read those. But I'll talk about if you have a good joint, really not much arthritis, how you can increase the movement with different modifications in an orthotic uh, as well. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Saviot, uh, all to you, talk a little bit about regenerative uh, treatments and some surgical treatments to finish it off. Hi guys, Dr. Xavier here. Um, I usually get pegged talking about these regenerative treatments. Um, interestingly, there's not a lot that we use the regenerative medicine for in terms of these stiff big toe joints. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in this space that we use for other things, whether it be shockwave therapy or amniotic tissue injections or PRP, but um, it's pretty much been my experience and I think fairly universal around the office that this stuff is not particularly useful for an advanced arthritic condition. Um, I'll buzz through them just kind of quickly to, for completeness sake, but um, it, in my opinion is that there's a, a minimal role, but they can sometimes buy a patient a little bit of time before they have to make a more intensive decision. Um, so stuff that's out there, we have this a device, two devices actually in the office that are both shockwave therapy devices and Effectively, what that's doing is kind of tricking your body into thinking that an acute injury has just occurred, and our bodies are really good at repairing acute injuries and pretty terrible at repairing chronic injuries. So you're almost switching a, 
a chronic injury to an acute injury pathway to try to get your body to heal it. However, when you're doing that for an arthritic joint, if there's no good cartilage there and it's a lot of bone that's overlying a big bone spur, um, you're really not going to do much other than maybe generate a little bit more bone production. So you're probably actually going to speed up the arthritic process in a really severely degenerated joint. So great for a lot of stuff. I will, I push a lot of people towards shockwave therapy for plantar fasciitis. It's first line for me for Achilles tendonitis. Shockwave is a uh, first line treatment modality for me, but not really for something like this. Um, next thing that we would consider that's out there is um, platelet rich plasma injections. These are okay in certain circumstances. Again, not really a big fan of these for arthritic conditions. Um, they certainly have more of a role for the Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis. And the last thing out there is these amniotic tissue graft injections. These actually have a small amount of utility, um, more so than the shockwave and the PRP, um, because they're basically amniotic tissue matrix that comes from that placental tissue um, from a live C-section birth. So you might be able to inject this into a joint and get a period of time where the, the cartilage can kind of respond a little bit, become a little more robust. It pulls in some of those nutrients from that placental material now, all of that is to say that if you don't do anything to treat the functional issue that's causing the toe to not move appropriately, if you're not in an orthotic, if you're not doing physical therapy treatments to help that big toe joint move better, you're making this even more temporary. So there is some role for this. The downside to that amniotic tissue stuff being that it is not cheap. It is, as you would expect, anything that comes from a screened donor with placental tissue and has to be processed a certain way so that it's cellularly active. That is not a cheap process. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the more important stuff, in my opinion, for these stiff big toe joints is the surgical, the, all of the surgical treatments that are available for managing big toe joint arthritis. Um, we've been really talking about how the, the big toe joint is kind of the first metatarsal and the big toe joint, the proximal phalanx, the base of the toe working in combination. But Dr. Kellner mentioned earlier that there's these two, he called them peanut shaped bones. They're mostly oval shaped bones, just to bust on them a little bit. Um, they're these little oval shaped bones that basically function like your kneecap underneath your big toe joint. And just like your kneecap, they have to glide smoothly for that joint to move well. Um, so there are a lot of times where our decisions based on what we're doing either in the in the office or in the operating room are based on how well those two little bones are moving with the whole joint complex. So keep that in mind as we're moving through some of these surgical discussions that this is really more of four bones moving rather than just two. And if you have to, you can put your hand on your knee and feel things moving around. So we'll go to these. These are sort of a schematic of how your big toe joint is supposed to move. If there's no weight under your big toe or under the big toe joint and you push up on the toe, you should get around 65 degrees of range of motion. So you push up under that toe and up it goes. And if it's less than 65, then it's usually some early stage arthritis. If it's in that like low 30s or less and there's no other forces being applied to it in this off weight bearing exam, then something's structurally wrong with that joint. That there's usually something in there, whether it's a bone spur or a bone chip or the, the shape of those bones is not aligning appropriately. Something's structurally wrong with that joint. Now there's another exam where we push up underneath the, the first metatarsal and then we test the range of motion of the big toe joint. And that's called a weight bear, a simulated weight bearing exam. Now, most of the time, a healthy toe joint will get about 45 degrees of range of motion there. So it goes down when you put some force underneath it. Um, but under most circumstances, that's what we would see is that the toe should move reasonably well. However, there's this other condition called functional hallux limitus, where the stability of the first metatarsal is not good. It has a lot, it has too much play up and down. So if you push that bone up, I use my arms all the time for this. So that toe should rock over the first metatarsal. But if you push that bone up and it goes too far, now there's nowhere for that bone to go. So it'll jam when it really shouldn't. That, that toe should be able to move reasonably well with a little bit of 
force applied underneath it. And that weight bearing exam is really important because that's what happens when you step down on the ground. If you if the ground is pushing up under your first metatarsal and it floats up, it's going to jam your big toe joint. And over time, you're going to destroy the cartilage within that big toe joint as they those two bones just bang against each other. Um, so it, with that all said, there's sort of a, a spectrum of disease progress that correlates directly to a spectrum of potential surgical options here. If your joint's perfect on the far left of the screen, you don't need any kind of surgery. If you have the, the follow the lines from left to right, from mild arthritis to severe arthritis, there are different options as you go along. Um, the most mild option is what we call a chylectomy. The next more intensive option is a joint implant. Um, and the most severe joints end up with a joint fusion. Now, there are a couple other things in, in there that I'll mention at the very end here, but a, a chylectomy, the best way to describe it is basically a joint clean out. So those bone spurs that are basically causing, I, I call it the door jam effect or a doorstop effect. It's like sticking something under your door. There's no way it's gonna swing appropriately. So if you go in, you take out the little doorstop, then that joint's gonna be able to rotate appropriately. Um, you can see in this picture that this was done the same way that I do it. You take a bone spur off of both sides. There's a little teeny bone spur that was taken off the base of the phalanx as well. So kind of have opposing door stops that you take out and that increases the range of motion of the joint. Really works great when there's just something causing an impingement. Works great when the cartilage is in good shape. Works great when those little sesamoids are moving well. And as long as you're managing the mechanical issue that caused it in the first place, which is usually functional hallux limitus, sometimes postural issues, sometimes shoe gear, sometimes posterior chain tightness with calf tightness, as long as you're managing those, you should be good to go to, to get another five, 10 years out of this procedure. Um, it, it's definitely a buy you time kind of procedure. Um, when this fails, and oftentimes this fails in the hands of doctors that are trying to do somebody a favor, if that joint is really beat up, you're not doing someone any favors by doing a joint clean out on this. Um, that's what that would be like taking a door stop out of a really rusty door hinge. Now that door, not only is it not going to move well, it's also going to become really creaky and squeaky. So in some cases that bone spur is stopping painful motion for patients. So if you remove the bone spur, now they have way more motion, but they have a lot more pain. Um, and in addition to that, if those little sesamoid bones aren't gliding well, then somebody's not a good candidate for the surgery. Or if there's other mechanical issues not managed with an orthotic or posture stuff, then we tend to not recommend a chylectomy. Uh, but these definitely have, those definitely have a role in early stage arthritis. Next stage up, this works really well for people who have moderate, moderate arthritis. So if they have a bone spur, you can kind of take down the bone spur. This is a joint implant. This one's made out of a cobalt chrome. I really like this for people who have no deformity at all. Um, there's another couple of joint implants out there. I really like this one because it requires minimal bone resection. And you can also decompress that joint a little bit to give it some more space. Um, there are a couple others out there. There's one made out of the same material as contact lenses. Looks like a little gumdrop that you stick in there. Um, and that can just serve as a joint spacer. But these work best for people who have a little bit of cartilage damage, mainly on one side of the joint. Um, minimal deformity that affects the, the alignment of the joint. As long And again, you got to treat the mechanical issues. But the most important thing for this is making sure that those little bones, the sesamoids, that they move well. Um, I see a lot of these implants get slammed into patients that really shouldn't have them. Um, some people don't, deserve, don't hear this the wrong way. Some joints don't deserve a joint implant. They're, they're too far gone. And it's the same story as the chylectomy. If you, if you go in there and you try to get this joint to move and the sesamoids don't move well, there's nothing that this joint implant is doing to help those sesamoids move better. And if all you've done is treat one of the four bones there, it's going to fail. Um, and that's oftentimes why I see these joint implants fail is the joints too damaged and the sesamoids aren't, aren't in good shape. If you try to stick this into a foot that has a bunion deformity, you're not going to get the joint to line up well. And if you don't manage things like elevatus and first ray instability, then that's also not going to go well with these implants. And then ultimately the gold standard for severely arthritic big toe joints is a joint fusion. Um, oftentimes patients freak out when they hear that we're gonna fuse a joint in their foot. 
Um, but if you look at the x-rays of the before on this person, these are different people, but very similar feet. Um, if you look at the before x-rays on this person, that joint was barely moving. That joint was moving maybe five degrees when I tested it in the office. And at any time it moved, it hurt. So what we do is we just finish the job that nature started. We remove any remaining cartilage that's in there. We fix the deformity of the toe so that it lines up better. We reduce all of that bony prominence. It looked like he had another brain growing out of his big toe joint there. Uh, you reduce all that bony prominence and then you just stiffen the joint. Um, these work really well when the cartilage is severely damaged or if the sesamoids are trashed or if there's deformity that needs to be corrected. You can pretty much treat any amount of bone spurring with this as well. Um, the only time you see something like this fail or if somebody's not a good candidate for it is if they have poor bone healing potential or they're not going to be able to stay off of their foot for a period of time postoperatively. Um, and then I put this last caveat in here of someone who needs first MPJ range of motion. That's your big toe joint. There are very few people in the world who actually need first MPJ big toe joint range of motion. Um, I've met maybe one person in my entire life that needs it, and it's because she was a yoga instructor. Um, but she had great positional awareness. We were able to kind of coach her through how to use her big toe joint better. And even still, she may end up with a fusion later in her life. But I have patients, I'm sure Dr. Feldman has patients too, that run marathons and half marathons on their big toe joint fusions. Um, it's all about positioning for those patients. Um, the only real restriction after a big toe joint fusion are similar to ones you would have before surgery, which are limitations to how high your heels can be for, for shoes for women. But for the most part, a wedge or a flat is still pretty comfortable, even with a big toe joint fusion. Last couple things, um, just for completeness sake, there are a couple small procedures you can do. This is a person who had what's called a metatarsal osteotomy called a Youngswick, where I mildly corrected her bunion, but more importantly, I decompressed that bone. I brought it back towards, towards the base of her heel and downwards as well. So if you look at those two lateral images, you can see that that joint space has more space and that first metatarsal has been shifted down just a little bit. And she's very, very comfortable cruising around in an orthotic managing well with her um, after her surgical correction. I did end up taking that screw out of her because it was a little prominent, but otherwise that's a, a great surgery. This is actually the same bunion surgery my mom had. <laughs> And that's pretty much it for surgical corrections. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, there was a few questions that were presented uh, prior. I wanna go over those as we finish up here, we're finishing up. If anybody wants to throw any into the chat, we can answer those as we're going to. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, the chat would, that was easier than having people talk. So write, write it in the chat if you have things you thought about that we didn't answer here. Um, if possible, discuss if the condition would cause pain along the outside side of the big toe in a presentation similar to gout. Um, I don't know, did you understand that Dr. Saviet, that question here, if possible discuss? Oh, well, I mean, with, with big toe joint arthritis, first MPJ pain, that can really present anywhere. Um, that can be top of the joint pain. Usually that's where the bone spur is. That can be on the medial side by the, the inside part of the foot as some patients describe it. Um, or on the lateral side or underneath. Like there's no, there's no specific part of the, of the joint that will hurt more than another. For most of these, it really comes down to x-ray findings um, and the overall function of the joint, not so much whether it's painful on the bottom or the top or the side. So I do use bottom pain to help me discern whether somebody has good sesamoids or not. And in, in, in the question about the gout, I think there, there is, so a gout is a red hot swollen joint. It may or may not have arthritis though. Um, a, a, an arthritic joint can develop gout, but it, they don't always go hand in hand, but they can, if you overdo it with a arthritic joint, it could look very similar to gout, I think. So I found massage treatment on my big toe, like I pull it out straight away from my body, um, is there any significance in that causing relief? Can you tell me why massage really seems to help relieve? Uh, I think I addressed this a little bit, just the yanking on the joint. It actually, there's a capsule around the joint and by pulling it out, kind of like cracking your, your joints here, 
and pulling it or putting what we call traction on it, it's going to loosen some things up, almost like what, what Dr. Savvy had said, you, you, you shorten the length of the bone, that gives it a little bit better of a space there, and it just tends to feel better. How long? I don't know. But uh, I, yes, I would say there's uh, there's another value to that. And joints usually they have little internal pressure sensors effectively. Um, so if you're pulling on the toe, you're creating negative pressure there by pulling on it. Um, and that almost tricks those cells into creating some more synovial fluid and gets that joint to fill up with a little bit more of that joint lubricant material in there. So that's generally why that helps more. Great. Um, are custom orthotics appropriate treatment for painful bunion pain on the top of the large toe? Uh, I'll ask Dr. Kellner here. You can talk a little bit about orthotics. Uh, will it help with pain on the top of the large toe? Um, certainly can. Um, to put it short, uh, depends on, because for me, when it comes to orthotics and bunions, you know, orthotics aren't going to correct a bunion by any means. It might control um, abnormal pronation or, or flat foot control, um, which can maybe prevent progression and so forth. Um, and then I think what Dr. Feldman had touched upon, there are certain modifications that we make um, in the orthotic specific to your joint, your symptoms, your x-rays, range of motion, and so forth. Um, we can make the orthotic so that they can help enhance the range of motion and your foot position versus immobilizing it um, with a stiffer uh, extension. So I, I would say yes, it's not guaranteed that it will help for everybody. That's why surgery exists. Good. Uh, and then the last question, uh, can toe wedges, kind of like potato wedges, can toe wedges improve stiffness? Uh, if yes, when it's the most appropriate time to wear them during the day or the night? Um, Dr. Uh, Savvy, he kind of got us onto this as well, called cluffy wedge, or I don't know if you want to use the term, but tell us about the wedges, if that, I think that's what they're talking about. So in the same way that a, a hammer toe can cause pain under a, a lesser metatarsal, we kind of use these little wedges to trick the big toe joint into functioning a little bit better. So um, if you read my blog on functional hallux limitus, it discusses this a little bit, but basically if this is the metatarsal and this is the toe. If you can pop that toe up just a little, it almost sits that first metatarsal down a bit and gets you into some of that range of motion earlier than you normally would in the phases of the gait cycle. So um, there's definitely a role for them. I usually, I typically use them in conjunction with a, a cutout under part of my first metatarsal um, when I make orthotics for a big toe joint that has a little bit of stiffness, but not a ton of arthritis. Um, and they're definitely more functional for during the day. Using a toe wedge at night isn't really gonna do a ton for you. Um, I think you're talking about maybe those little dyna splint things that the toe wiggle machine, um, never seen anything about those that proves their, uh, their functionality or the, their necessity. You're probably better off tugging on your toe for a couple minutes every day, just to give yourself a little traction and improve that synovial fluid volume. Good. Well, I, uh, I put here, if any, anyone that's watching has questions, uh, certainly here's our phone number. You can ask questions there, make an appointment with us. Um, here's the website. I'm going to put this blog, I'm putting it in the chat. Um, I'll be uploading the, the video and, and Dr. Saviot's articles on the blog under this section of uh, all about big toe pain. Uh, I don't see any questions in here. Um, and... I just got one. We just got yeah, one go from Jay Brown. It says, as far as wedges, not toe wedges, but shoes that are wedges, this is what happens when you have an office that's run by only guys. We totally missed the mark that wedges are a type of shoe. I knew that, this did, went right over my head. Uh, this isn't a question, but as a 22 year old lady fashion, lady podiatrist that likes fashion, rocker bottom wedges, rocker bottom wedge shoes feel so much better than any other heels. And that's almost not surprising. Uh, ah, 22 year podiatrist, got it. Um, the, uh, it's not surprising that a rocker bottom is gonna feel a little bit better. That rock, a shoe that has a, that's shaped like this rather than a flat surface is going to help you roll through that big toe joint without as much issue. That makes, that's absolutely perfect. And I, I put a lot of folks into Hoka's, um, the brand of shoe that has that rocker bottom, but only if they have a foot that's going to accommodate that well. Um, a nice heel rocker sometimes helps with that as well. There's a couple other shoe brands out there that have that. 
Um, generally speaking, though, a shoe with a lower heel drop tends to be better for hallux limitus if you can tolerate it in the all in all other places too. Great, great questions. Uh, thank you for everyone uh, that joined us. I'll, once again, I'll put this up on our blog afterwards. We had a, a good turnout and thank you guys for, for joining. You have, a, have a nice night to everyone. We're going to uh, end this webinar. That was good.